In this study, we're going to be looking at the coming of the bridegroom, and in particular, the relationship and maturity of the bride. Matthew 25, verse 6 says, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. The revelation of Christ as the bridegroom permeates his teaching and his parables and suggests the grand truth to those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. More than once he refers to himself in his utterances as the bridegroom. The solemn midnight cry raised by the expectant throng in Matthew 25 and verse 6 is, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, and they that are ready are represented as accompanying him to the marriage. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 19, Jesus speaks of his disciples as children of the bride chamber, who at that time had the bridegroom with them. Jesus alludes to the wedding in Matthew chapter 22, verses 2 through 14. And in the earnest exhortation which he utters, impressing upon his disciples the necessity of being prepared for his coming as bridegroom. In Luke chapter 12, verses 35 and 36, it says, Let your loins be girded about, and your lamps burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. And in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 2, he suggests the true purpose of all God's dealings with man in the parable of the wedding feast, whose opening words declare that, quote, a certain king made a marriage for his son, end quote. Now let us take a look at the revelation that lies couched in the passage recorded in connection with our Lord's miracle of turning water into wine. In John chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Let us consider this marriage in Cana of Galilee. Jesus began his public ministry at a wedding. And may I say to you that this is important, and it is profound, and it seems in passing strange. A question might arise, why didn't he begin at Jerusalem, the religious capital of the world? Or why didn't he go to the temple to begin his public ministry? Or why didn't he go to Rome, the power capital and political capital of the world of that day? Or why not go to Corinth, a great commercial center at the time? Why begin at Cana of Galilee at this wedding? The Lord came from heaven's glory, and he began his ministry at a wedding of two unknown poor peasants in the little village of Cana. But if we stand back and get a correct perspective of the sweep of the entire picture, I think we will understand it. You go back to the very beginning. Marriage was the first institution that God made for man. And it was none other than Jesus himself that brought the first woman to the first man. In Genesis chapter 2 verses 22 and through 24, he introduced them and he performed the marriage for them and made them one. And if we look at Revelations chapter 19 and verse 9, we discover that there is an event called the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Lamb is there and a people called the Bride is there. The psalmist relates the wonderful scene in these descriptive words of Psalm 45, 9. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. 
Long centuries later, John the Revelator penned these words of spiritual instruction. Found in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 8 in the Amplified Bible, it reads Let us rejoice and shout for joy, exulting and triumphant. Let us celebrate and ascribe to him glory and honor, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has prepared herself. She has been permitted to dress in fine radiant linen, dazzling and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Long ago in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. While God said it is not good that man should be alone, I would like to give it another rendition, and it goes like this. It is not good that God should be alone. I am convinced that God's creation is an expression of God's own personal character and state of being. I believe that when God saw Adam in his loneliness and said it is not good that the man should be alone, God was expressing a consciousness within himself. God had need for companionship. This divine need is expressed by the Apostle in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, which says, According as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. God's ultimate need was for the companionship of beings like himself, of his own kind, with whom he could share his mind and heart, and whom he could incorporate into the outworking of his own eternal purposes. As we view from the Father's heart, it becomes obvious that God in his paternal nature has marked out for himself a vast family which shares his very own life, nature, spirit, purpose, and power. I don't believe that any creature or entity which existed before man, either in heaven above or the earth beneath, provided what God needed. This is the condition which prompted God in that long ago beginning to issue the wonderful fiat in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 in Young's literal translation, it reads, And Jehovah God saith, Not good for the man to be alone, I do make him an helper, as his counterpart. The Goodspeed translation reads, It is not good for the man to be alone. I must make a helper for him who is like him. Another translation says, And God made for Adam a comparable helper. That is the first symbolism of the bride of Christ. God made for Adam someone with whom he should have complete and total intimacy. And God himself had that desire, so he came in the cool of the evening to fellowship with this man and woman made in his image. If the Christ is to have a bride, then the bride must be comparable to Christ. How could Christ become intimate with anyone who is not comparable to him? God gives us patterns in the Bible. All the patterns point to the central truth that God wants a people for himself. A special, purified, obedient, prepared, developed, matured, loving, capable people joined in union with himself. All other doctrines and revelations are secondary to that. God's desire for a people is the thrust of the entire message of the Word of God. Everything must revolve around that truth. It was not good for man to be alone, and God was saying that it was not good for God to be alone. He wanted offspring, 
And Acts chapter 17, verses 28 and 29, tells us that we are the offspring of God. Nature itself teaches us that pigs have little pigs and dogs have little dogs. And I do not hesitate to add that gods have little gods. Psalms chapter 82 verse 6 says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. We are made in His image, comparable. When once we learn this grand truth, all the Word of God begins to fall into place. Therefore, it is most appropriate that the Lord begin His ministry at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. There He went and put His seal of approval and His blessing upon it. He was there by His very presence to proclaim that union between God and man is the grand theme and purpose of God in creation and redemption. As God continues to lead in this hour with a people to bring them into the fullness, there are questions which arise concerning definitions and applications of terms which the Spirit of God is bringing forth as He speaks to His elect. Two of the terms which the Spirit is emphasizing are brideship and sonship. Some become confused by these terms and wonder whether there is a difference between the two or whether the bride and the sons are the one and same company of people. It shouldn't take much reflection to reach the conclusion that a bride and a son are not the same. If you are a married man with a family, just think, Are your wife and your son the same? Though it is evident that they are two separate persons, what is it that really makes the difference? While it's true that a wife is always feminine and a son is always masculine, the primary difference is one of relationship, the way in which they are related to you. In like manner, through the new birth, we have come into the family of God the very universal family which is God. As Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 say, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And being birthed into the God family, we are now related to God. We have entered into a family relationship with Him. And we are His own life form and species. One can enter God's family only by birth. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3 and 5, Except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 in the Amplified, it reads, But to as many as did receive him, he gave the authority, power, privilege, right to become the children of God who owe their birth neither to bloods, nor to the will of the flesh, nor to the will of man, but to God. They are born of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1 calls them babes in Christ. And 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 calls them newborn babes. And all children who have not grown up into spiritual maturity are always referred to simply as the children of God without reference to gender or sex. 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 in Philip's translation reads, Consider the incredible love that the Father has shown us in allowing us to be called children of God. And that is not just what we are called, but what we are. Here and now, my dear friends, we are God's children. We don't know what we shall become in the future. We only know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So we see that in our spiritual infancy and immaturity, God doesn't call us either sons or His wife, but His children. In the Word of God, the Greek word nepios is used and translated in the English as babes. It is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1 where it says, And I, brethren, 
could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Likewise, it is used in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, where it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. The Greek word technon is translated as the word children in the Bible. This is used in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1 where it says, Children, or technon, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And finally we have the Greek word huios, which is translated as sons in the Bible. This is translated as sons in Romans 8:19, where it reads, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Children is our first relationship to God and his family. We are his children. And what we are ultimately destined to be has not yet come into view or become reality until we pass our spiritual adolescence. I cannot overemphasize the importance of this truth of relationships. Each of us is related to a great many people in a variety of ways. To my wife, I am a husband. To my sons and my daughter, I am a father. To my father, I am a son. To my brothers, I am a brother. To many, I am a friend. To others, I am an uncle, nephew, or cousin. Obviously, this doesn't make me more than one person. I remain but one individual. But in my relationships to others, I am different things. The Lord Jesus has spoken of in Scripture as our father, brother, husband, friend, master, king, priest, judge, and so forth. All such names and titles are but designations of offices held or particular relationships the person has had to the people. And yet each is, in a sense, like a different person in each unique relationship. There are many profound and beautiful ties between Jesus and the elect, which are shadowed forth in the tender relationships between Adam and Eve. For Adam was in reality both father and mother to Eve. And then she was not only his child, but his sister as well, and also his wife. The same person can stand in varied relationships, filling different roles, while remaining the same person. All the right and natural relationships in which human beings stand to each other are meant to reveal something in God, or some relation in which he stands to us. He is as a king to his subjects, giving them laws and governing them for their good. He is a father to his children, providing for their needs, training and disciplining them in love to become mature members of the family of Elohim. But there is something, if one may say so, deeper than even this, something that corresponds to the tenderness of a mother, especially in her gentle power of comforting the weary and wounded spirit of her child. In Isaiah chapter 66, verses 12 and 13 in the Amplified, Isaiah said, For thus says the Lord, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. Then you shall be nursed, you shall be carried on her hip, and be trotted on God's maternal knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so will I comfort you. The English word one in this passage is the Hebrew word amen. And the prophet is not thinking of a little child, but of the grown man. In the original, his words are, as a man who his mother comforts, so will I comfort you. The feminine name of God is El Shaddai, meaning the breasted or a woman's breast and indicates the one who, out of maternal bountifulness, is the shedder forth of blessings, comfort, nourishment, and life. 
There is something in God which corresponds to that power of tender mother comfort, something of which indeed earthly mother comfort is only the shadow, the earthly reflection. There is the motherhood of God. When we get a clear spiritual discernment of these multiplied relationships of God to us, it breaks us into perfect abandonment to Him and draws us like the resistless tide of a sucking whirlpool down into the fathomless gulf of His love and all-sufficiency. Children are children. Children are not sons in the scriptural sense, for sons are those who have grown up into the nature and authority of the Father. We can see this maturing set forth in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, which says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Likewise, a girl, as long as she is a child, is neither prepared for or capable of fulfilling the role of a wife. In order to enter into marriage, a young girl must pass through years of physical, mental, and emotional development. Finally, upon becoming mature in all these areas, she is fitted for marriage and her role as a wife. And so is it in God's family. The term child describes the believer in his walk of immaturity in God. But as one begins to grow up into spiritual maturity, it is then that the truly feminine and masculine aspects of his or her relationship to God begin to form and become manifest. And starting from early childhood, we all begin to notice there is indeed a difference. We become increasingly aware of it as we grow up. But it is only as fully developed adults that the true power, potential, and purpose of the feminine and masculine attributes find their fulfillment. As God becomes so many things to us, even Mother, so must we become many things to Him. When God created man, male and female, in His image, He revealed that He is Himself male and female in His attributes and nature. In spiritual maturity, we enter into relationship with God in all the facets of His nature. We may become the bride of Christ and the sons of the Father and many other things as well. The bride relationship bears the feminine nature, whereas the sonship relationship bears the characteristics of the masculine nature. Aggressiveness, boldness, strength, valor, authority, power, and dominion are among the traits of the masculine sex. Therefore, the Lord says in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 7, verse 2, verse 26 through 27, and chapter 3, verse 21, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. To him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Modesty, gentleness, tenderness, love, and dependence are attributes of the feminine sex. Spiritually, these are the characteristics of the bride of Christ, as the Apostle says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 27 in the Amplified, where he says, Wives, be subject, be submissive, and adapt yourselves to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, himself the Savior of his body. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, 
that he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and faultless. The way to sonship is brideship. We need to see that brideship speaks of the spiritually feminine relationship of intimate love and reverent submission to Christ, whereas sonship embodies the spiritually masculine characteristics of strength, authority, power, and dominion to rule and reign over all things. Never become so overbalanced in zeal to become sons of God that you circumvent the marvelous reality of brideship. The simple but sublime truth is that the way to sonship is brideship. This is why the Spirit has given us in Revelation chapter 12 the example of a glorious sun-clad woman giving birth to a remarkable man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. It is the inworking of brideship that births the realm of sonship. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Your relationship to Christ as a bride will forerun your relationship to the Father as a son. Brideship is the harbinger of sonship. It is through intimacy of fellowship and vital union with Christ, made one in Him in love, that we are initiated into the illustrious glory of strength and dominion over all things as sons of God. We must know Him. Any man can come to know something of the acts and ways of God, but only those born from above who also follow on to know the Lord can ever come to know Him in the most wonderfully personal and intimate manner. The depth of knowing Him is like the intimate relationship of a man with his beloved wife, in which love he seeks to reproduce after his own kind. In fact, this is precisely the way in which the Scriptures in a number of cases makes use of the word know to describe the giving and receiving of seed in the act of love. For example, we read in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. This statement doesn't mean that Adam was able to recognize his wife as he walked about the house. Knowing in the sense of recognition doesn't beget children. When Adam knew his wife, he explored her emotional and physical being, and she knew him in return in a personal and intimate way that words could never communicate. Only by the experience of the sexual relationship does man know woman in this sense, and she him. We must understand that it is only in that exquisite relationship where the believing heart completely yields itself to the spirit, the presence, the mind, and the will of God, where the believer proves by his wholehearted response that he totally and truly loves the Lord, that he knows and is known of God. This is the basis for Israel as a people being given the name Wife of Jehovah and the chosen ones of this age the intimate title the Bride of Christ. As husband and wife, by means of the act of knowing, become one flesh, so Christ and the believer, by the spiritual act of knowing, become one spirit. As 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 says, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. The intimate relationship portrayed here is only found in the lives of those who are following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Now let us take a look at what it means to be the bride of Christ. If you have never really fallen in love with the Christ of God and made him your head and absolute Lord, don't ever expect to be a son. If you are not truly virgin in your desires towards the Lord, if you are not walking in the Spirit, 
keeping yourself unto him and unto him alone. If you have never really forsaken the company of the wanton harlot of the mystery of Babylon, the carnal religious systems called the church, if you have not renounced the schemes and plans and ambitions of the carnal mind, nor abandoned your love of the world and the desires of the flesh, don't expect to be birthed into that glorious company of the sons of God who will set creation free from bondage and corruption. If you have any other love before him, any other master that rules your life, any other Lord that dictates your actions, any reserved areas of your life, then you have not yet learned how to be a bride to Christ. One must first bow in feminine love and submission to Jesus Christ the Lord as a wife before he can pass beyond birth to stand taught and elect in the majesty and splendor of sonship. It's just that simple. There's no other way. Only the Holy Spirit can teach us how to truly be a bride. As I have pointed out, the key to being a wife is love and submission. We are prone to think of submission in such a carnal way. The term conjures up images of the husband ruling, bossing, and loading it over, barking commands to his wife, while the little woman, intimidated, cowering, complies with his every demand. But true, godly submission is the love of a woman that is so pure and intense that she wants to yield herself to the high desires of her husband. A woman so in love with her man that it transcends infatuation. Her submission becomes a willing and loving laying down of her own life until she no longer has a life because her life is surrendered to another. Her cry becomes, I don't want my life, I want to share yours. When we enter into the bride relationship to Christ, we lay down our own identity and take upon us a new nature. In the feminine aspect of this nature, we learn to yield and obey. This is the action of our will, giving our will over to become aligned with His will. Submission is more than blind obedience to demands laid upon us. It is the loving surrender of the will. Otherwise, one will soon revolt and try to throw off the yoke or find a way of escape. But when it is our will to do His will, we stand steadfast and carry on. There is a giving up, a surrender of our will, that is, the flesh-motivated will, the carnal-minded will, but His will in us is to be retained at all cost. As Philippians 2.13 says, God is working in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. And we say, I will, in surrender to all of His exercise of His will in us. It seems that many people are more afraid of God's will for their life than of anything else as if it would be bad for them, or hurt them, or cause them distress or pain, make them miserable, and they seem to fear yielding to his will, as if that would end all the joys of life. And yet they say they want to go to heaven. But surely heaven implies wondrous bliss because his will is being perfectly done there. In fact, heaven is a state or condition the glory of which includes perfect oneness in His will. God loves His creation, and the will of love always seeks the best for its loved one. Even in the natural, we would, if we had the power and the means to carry it out, do much more for those we love simply because it is the nature and the will of love to do so. It is the hangover of tradition's monster God that causes men to be afraid of God's will. But love removes all this terror. Oh, how much struggle and friction go out of our lives when we come to the point where we will have God's will and then rest in the outworking of His will. Love is the key. 
There is a call to love him so passionately that everything else appears as hatred in comparison. When we are mere children, we love him out of a childish, immature love. We love him primarily for what he gives us. When you hear someone testify, I love the Lord because he saved me, or I love the Lord because he healed me, or I love the Lord because he answers my prayers and supplies all my needs, you know that you listen to the testimony of a child imperfect in love. That kind of talk is like the girl who married a rich man and said, I love John because he provides me with a million dollar beach house, a new Mercedes, a mink coat, and a thousand dollar a week spending money. Obviously, she loves John only for his money. If John were to lose his wealth, her love would soon die. And unfortunately, most immature Christians, the children of God, profess to love God basically out of these same selfish motives. But a true wife loves her husband for who and what he is. When a wife really loves her husband, she loves him just as much if they are poor and have nothing. As God brings forth a people into brideship to Christ, this people is coming to love our Lord Jesus Christ for who he is and not because of the blessings and benefits received from his loving hands. Children are always excited about the gift, but the bride is excited about the giver. Do we really love him or are we merely using him? Do we know what it means to come into his sweet presence, asking nothing, but only reaching out to him with gratitude and thanksgiving for loving us so completely? Haven't we become very selfish and egocentric in our prayers? We will pray to save America from judgment. Spare us, don't judge us, we cry. Give us, meet us, help us, bless us, prosper us, use us, protect us. And that may all be scriptural in its place, but the focus is still on us. Even in our work for him, we have become selfish. We want him to bless our service to him to prove our faith is genuine. We want to be considered diligent, capable, successful as a sign of his blessing upon us. But the claims of the bridegroom are paramount upon the bride. She is to love him not for his gifts, not for what he can do for her or make her, but for himself. Likewise, we must be a virgin. 2 Corinthians 11.2 says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. To be a virgin means to be pure, undefiled, and separated unto the Lord. God is creating the desire in a people in this hour to be truly virgin in their desires toward Him. We have known what it is to be conformed to the course of this world, and we have known what it is to trust Christ as Savior while remaining entangled in all the defilement of a corrupt Babylonian religious church system. But God is calling forth a glorious body of Christ who because of the quickening of the Holy Spirit is desiring to be virgins separated only unto her glorious bridegroom unto intimate and vital union with him. How lightly we sometimes take the purposes of God in us. It is one thing to be washed in the blood free from all our past sins and quite another thing to truly be virgin in our desires to keep ourselves only unto the Lord for union with Him. Separation is coming from everything of the flesh, the world and the devil, and from every vestige of entanglement with false religious Babylon, which we have made our head in place of our Lord Jesus Christ. Some are striving for a greater understanding of the scriptures and the things of God, and some for a bigger and better revelation than ever before. 
Some are striving to become like him, formed into his image. Some are looking to become his dwelling place on this earth. All these are fine goals, but they are not the goal that God intends for us. The goal and the only goal is set out in the first commandment, which bids us seek God first with every part of our being. To move into him, to establish a oneness with him. This is the only central goal of it all. So often we are seeking something so close to the real thing, and yet not the real central goal. We seek God in order to receive something from Him, or to be made holy, or like Him in some other way. We seek Him to have Him dwell in us, or to have His power, or joy, or peace. And none of these are wrong. They are just not the goal. What kind of response do you think you would get if you were moving into a love relationship with the intention of marrying that person? And then when they ask you why you wanted to enter into that depth of a relationship with them, you replied, so that I can become like you, or so that I can have your power. Too often that is the way we look at God. We have sought to come close to him so that we might become like him or so that his power might be seen in us. And both are admirable desires, but they are not desires that will be fulfilling to the heart of God. He wants us to draw close to him, not that we might become like him or that his nature be found in us, though inevitably that will happen, but solely to draw close to him because we love him for what he is. He wants us to come to Him with no other intention in our hearts but to fellowship with Him, to love Him, and to appreciate Him, sharing with Him all the love flow of our hearts. Everything else, no matter how fine a goal, must be second to that. In Revelation 21.9, the prophet was commanded, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. To understand what the Spirit means by the term bride, we must break away from our Western concepts of what a bride is. Bride in Hebrew is kala, meaning the completed one, or the perfected one. It reveals the concept of a woman being completed once she is married to her husband. Just as Paul said when he said, you are complete in him. When two become one, right man, right woman, they are totally dependent upon each other. They will never be anything without the other again. Each sex is incomplete without the other. In Genesis, before ever Adam named the woman God took and builded from his being, he did some explaining. Genesis 2.23 says, And Adam said, This one, she, now bone from my bones, flesh from my flesh, this one, she, shall be called woman, or Isha, because this one, she, was taken from man, Ish. Adam said this now, or literally, this one, she. There is no verb here. You don't need a verb. Remember the Lord is bringing to him the most perfect and beautiful woman ever formed. And Adam said this one, she bone from my bones. Adam knew that something was missing from his very being and that this woman would complete him. So he says, flesh from my flesh, this one, she, shall be called Isha or woman. Why called Isha? Because she was taken out of Ish, which means man. Once the woman is given to him, they become Ish and Isha. When Ish and Isha are joined together, they become one. He fulfills her and she completes him. She is the bride, the completed one, the perfected one. 
In Revelation 21.9, the messenger says to John, Come hither, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. The message is clear. Come hither, and I will show you a completed person, a perfected person, or if you please, a corporate body of completed and perfected people. The holy city of New Jerusalem is the beautiful, symbolic representation of the virtues, nature, and glory of the Lamb's Bride. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, we are told that in this our day shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins. Virgins are pure and undefiled. Not the common run of Christians who have defiled themselves with every lover idol they can find and have departed from a walk in the Spirit of God and slithered off into the ditch there to slop and flounder around in error and deception and ignorance and fleshly religious activities of every kind. Virgins are not even defiled with women, with the organized church systems. As Revelation 14.4 says, They follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes, and not human leaders who have set themselves up between Christ and His saints. These ten virgins took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Not very many people who name the name of Christ are doing that. Not very many know who or what the bridegroom is, and therefore do not know where or how to meet him. Not very many Bible students even suspect that the coming of the bridegroom is different than the coming of the king or the coming of Christ in other dimensions. Not knowing who or what the bridegroom is, they therefore cannot know how to go forth to meet him. Unfortunately, most Christians are busily preparing themselves to go up to meet the bridegroom. All their fuss and stir will be in vain, because no one will ever go up to meet him. There's not one scripture in the entire Bible that speaks of being caught up to meet the bridegroom or to eat the marriage supper in the sky. Most of the confusion is caused by people not being able to distinguish the differences between the facets of his coming. They have confused his coming as the son of righteousness with his coming as the judge. They have confounded his coming as a refiner's fire with his coming as the rain. They have mistaken his coming with his saints for his coming in his saints. They know nothing of the distinction between his coming as king and his coming as bridegroom. To such an unenlightened minds there is but one single coming of Christ when he crashes down through the clouds of earth's atmosphere. Most saints today are not preparing to meet the bridegroom, but are trying to fix themselves up so that they will be all ready to be whisked away into the clouds instead. But not so with virgins. They are in the right place at the right time and are looking for a very blessed event, the coming of Christ as the bridegroom. And they are spiritually intelligent enough to know that no one will ever go up to meet the bridegroom. But in order to meet the bridegroom, one must go out. Matthew 25, 6 says, Go ye out to meet him. And the only way one can go out to meet the bridegroom is to come out from among the world and the flesh and the harlot churches with their idolatries and miserable distortions of truth to be joined unto the Lord in intimacy of fellowship and vital union. The cry was, Behold the bridegroom. This addresses the heart. It is not a historic event. As sure as you hold any truth intellectually, you will eventually become an opposer of it. If you hold the coming of the Lord as a singular historic event, I am bold to say that he will come and you will not recognize him in his coming 
and you will oppose him when he comes, just as did the Jews of old. The coming of the bridegroom is that revelation of the Christ that causes you to know that you are united to him. It is the conscious knowledge and the experiential reality. You cannot understand the relationship of the bride until you know union. You cannot be in that particular concert with Christ which the name of bride expresses until you yield yourself to be made one in him. And this is a present reality. If you say the bride is only future, if you say the coming of the bridegroom is in the sweet by and by, you ignore the words of Revelation 22:17 that says the spirit and the bride say come. When I know that I am united to the Christ, I am so identified with his interest that they are paramount with me. Few know it. A wife is one who has reached full maturity, one who has given herself completely and unreservedly for her lover, one who has lost her own name and identity to take his. She has left all to follow him. The result of such a union is as stated by Paul in Romans 7, 4, that we should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. The word bridegroom is from the Hebrew shetan, of which the root meaning is to contract affinity. According to Webster, affinity carries these shades of meaning. One, relationship by marriage. Two, close relationship or connection. Three, a similarity or likeness implying common origin, or for a spontaneous attraction to or liking for a person or thing, five, a person of the opposite sex who especially attracts one, six, the force that causes the atoms of certain elements to combine and stay combined. Affinity means you have the same genetic makeup, you have the same thoughts, the same ideas, the same emotions, the same actions, even when you are not physically together. It is to be like another person. Bridegroom means affinity, to contract affinity. The bridegroom agrees and purposes to spiritually bring affinity into the life of his completed person. As the bride, you will yield yourself to the process of completion and perfection in the Christ. But as bridegroom, he is determined that it will happen. He is resolved that this high and holy calling be your destiny. First, he attracts you, he allures you, charms you, draws you, captivates you with his love. Then he invites you to a contract, an agreement, a covenant. By the terms of that contract, you will come into oneness with the Christ. And by the very genes of your new creation life, you will think and purpose and act like him in all things. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 through 27 say, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The bridegroom has special qualifications. He must love the bride in a special way. He must give himself to her. He must make a vow to her and enter into a covenant relationship with her. He is fully responsible for loving and providing for her every need. There are six things listed in this passage of scripture that the Lord, the heavenly bridegroom, assumes as his responsibility. Number one, loving her. 
Number two, giving to her. Number three, sanctifying her. Number four, cleansing her. Number five, presenting her to himself proudly. And number six, nourishing and cherishing her. It is interesting to note one characteristic that is significantly missing from this list. Have you noticed that there is never any chastisement spoken of in Scripture with regard to the bride? The Bible says that sons are corrected and chastised, but the bride is not in any way punished. Hers is a love relationship whereby she does what pleases her Lord just because of who she is, his bride. It is the relationship that is the emphasis when the bride is spoken of, not the usefulness. The sons are chastened and corrected because they are given greater power and authority. But the bride is loved, cherished, nourished, attired, cleansed and made beautiful because she is made one in him. Sons are taught how to use great power and glory, whereas the bride is instructed how to fulfill and complete her husband. We must understand that in Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 through 5, the woman gives birth to the man-child. The way to sonship is brideship. It is the relationship of brideship that births the reality of sonship. One must fall madly, fiercely, intensely in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, making him head and absolute Lord, keeping oneself unto him and him alone, entering the secret chamber of his love, reserving nothing unto oneself. We must first bow in feminine love and submission before we can be birthed to stand tall and erect in the majesty of sonship unto God. There's no other way. Union with Christ is most assuredly not a physical union. To be the bride of Christ does not mean that we experience a physical love relationship with Jesus. It's a spiritual union, joined to the Lord as one spirit, as stated in 1 Corinthians 6.17. Since it's a spiritual union, it doesn't necessitate the physical presence of the man Jesus as bridegroom. Don't bother gazing into the sky to behold his coming down through the clouds. You will never see the bridegroom riding upon a cloud. The coming of the bridegroom is a spiritual coming forth of the Lord unto his elect bride. Hear the words, Go ye out to meet him. So many Christians today are satisfied with merely an entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior. Their eyes are blinded to eternal values, and any efforts to lead them on to higher ground are rebuffed and resisted by human reasoning which asks why one should waste time on them since they are saved. But salvation, while it is the most astounding miracle of the ages, yet is the birth of a mere spiritual infant. There are many further steps which must follow this birth if one is to come into all the glories and the full heritage which is prepared for those who follow on to know the Lord. And not one of us has come all the way up to our full privileges in Christ. There is great glory and heavenly wealth awaiting those who become fully equipped unto God's great plan and purposes. Salvation is nothing more than the beginning of an eternal heavenly God kind of life. Then the recipient may remain a baby spirit delighting only in the fact of its childish spiritual existence. Salvation is a free gift through unmerited mercy and favor, a new heavenly life begun by means of the new birth. But the outworking of the divine purpose for that life 
is realized only by those who have salvation and then go on to grow up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. May God help us to truly be a bride and that we may also learn how to be a son that God may in and through us be all in all.